Uh, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Devon, thank you so very much. You know, every body of water needs an aqueduct through which it can flow. And the beloved family, we also become an aqueduct for the living spirit of God to flow through us. And may our hearts be set with such passion to know him and say, God, flow through me. How many of you desire that in your life this morning? Would you just lift your hand and say, God, fill my heart. Shape my life, God. Let me be drawn inexorably towards your presence and your power. Today, Lord, I ask that you will do something that is defining in this church. With each one of us, Lord, I pray that it will be a moment of a divine intersection between you, your word, and our lives, that we will be malleable and you would use us and deploy us for your kingdom purpose. We give you the praise. And everyone said, amen and amen. Didn't you enjoy Devon's ministry this morning? Wow, Devon, where are you? There he is. You know, Devon, I would love to, you know what I was thinking, family? As Devon was thinking, I would love Devon Webb and Kevin Spivey to get together and sing a duet. Kevin, would you stand? Stand up, Kevin. There you are, brother. Obey. Atta boy. This man can sing too, and, and you guys get into a stratosphere that uh, is pretty amazing. So maybe we'll make that happen one time on an occasion that Devin and Kev, Kevin, <laughs> Kevin and Gavin would sing a duet together. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Well, family, I want to welcome you to this Sunday morning, our World Missions Convention, themed all generations. And how wonderfully appropriate for the theme of our Missions Convention to be all generations because our keynote speaker is a man that God is using in an incredible way to reach the children and the youth of our world. You're going to be challenged today, I promise you. Your life is going to be collided in such a manner that you will never be the same again. Rob Hoskins is the president of One Hope, a global ministry that seeks as its purpose, its singular focus, to place the scriptures in the hand of every child and young person on the planet today. And since 1987, they have distributed over half a billion portions of the scriptures to the children of our world. Paul writes to us in Romans, he said that the, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation. And can I tell you that what you hear, when you hear this story this morning on what God is doing through this man and through the ministry, the global ministry of One Hope, your life will be deeply and profoundly touched and stirred. Ladies and gentlemen, would you welcome to our pulpit this morning this servant of God, Rob Hoskins, who's coming to challenge us with the word of God. Let's welcome him. Rob, you have friends here, and you have a fertile field in which to plant the seed of God. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor. Wow, praise the Lord. What a wonderful presence of the Lord in this place this morning. Amen? Man, I almost ran up those stairs as fast as your pastor, but not quite, man. He, is, he takes them two at a time like nothing. Sorry for my voice this morning. I've been doing a lot of preaching this week and uh, I'm feeling it a little bit. So just uh, pray for me this morning that I can deliver God's word the way he wants me to. Um, I just feel so uh, honored to be here. I told pastor in the study between services that um, you never really know what you're gonna get from Sunday to Sunday. You come into a church, you really don't know the congregation and sometimes you feel like you're coming in and you're preaching to a congregation where you're trying to break up some hard ground so that you can hope that the word will be planted through the seed and sometimes the ground is very hard and then you go into other places where you can tell the ground has been worked and the soil has been broken so that the word of God can be spread and planted in people's hearts. And can I just tell you from what I sense here this morning and what I sensed earlier in the first service that your pastor, your shepherd has done a good job of breaking up the soil and that you would understand that the world is lost so that the seed that goes out this morning is gonna find its way into your hearts. And thank you, Pastor, for your ministry. Why don't you thank your pastor for him being your shepherd and all he is to you this morning. I'm a little bit emotional this morning. Uh, as Pastor, uh, Associate Pastor said, Devin and I have traveled together for 16 years. 
And you look at him and you go, yeah, he was about 12 years old when he started with me. I'm just waiting for his voice to change and then we're all in trouble, but I'm the one that sounds like my voice is changing, actually. Um, and uh, Devin feels a call and I, I confirm that call in his life to move into pastoral ministry. So we actually only have one Sunday left together after 16 years. So um, I love you, Devin. No. Oh. He's been a wonderful Timothy in my life, and I know God's going to use him in the pastoral ministry, and I, I bless him in that, but it is a little emotional for me to lose a partner of 16 years. Turn with me, if you would, to Revelation 22. I'll make it real easy for you this morning. It's the last chapter in the Bible. Revelation 22, beginning in verse 12. This is Jesus speaking. Behold, I am coming soon. And my reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and the beginning and the end. Blessed are those that wash their robes. It's those of us that stay righteous. That they may have the right to the tree of life, and that they may go through the gates into the city. I want us to see what Jesus is showing us here. He's showing us a walled, a gated city. And inside the gates of that city are all of those of us who have accepted him as Lord and Savior. If you've accepted Jesus this morning, you're not waiting for some future dispensation to enter the kingdom of God. If you've accepted Jesus, you are in the kingdom of God this morning, amen? You've tasted of him, you know his peace, you know his joy, you have his satisfaction in your heart, and you have the right to eternal life. But in the next verse, it says outside. Outside are the dogs and those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I want you to see that with me this morning. On the outside of this great kingdom that you and I live in are all of those people who either have rejected Jesus as Lord and Savior, but also a third of the world's population who has never once had a chance to know who Jesus is. They wait on the outside of the kingdom this morning. And let me tell you, friends and brothers and sisters, they are lost this morning. They do not have the right to eternal life. They have not experienced the peace, joy, and love, and satisfaction that those of us in the kingdom would have. May I add, particularly on this Sunday, with the release of a book by Rob Bell that says, Love Wins, that teaches a message of universalism that would make us believe that those on the outside still have a chance to come into the kingdom without a knowledge of Jesus. Let me tell you, it is not truth. And we, the church, have to stand up at a moment like this and realize this missional call to his church to proclaim his name to those that are on the outside of the kingdom this morning. We are at threat in our nation this morning theologically. But I love what it says in the next verse because this is true love. When Bob Bell says love wins, he's not talking about this type of love because there is only one type of love. It is a sacrificial love. It is a substitutionary love. It is a love of reconciliation that can only come from Father God himself sending his son into the world to redeem us from our lostness and keep us from the wrath of eternal damnation. And so Jesus comes in this verse and he says, but I, Jesus, I, Jesus, have sent my angels to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and the morning star and the spirit and the bride. Who's the bride this morning? Church, we are, that's right, we are. What do we say? We say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And whoever is thirsty, and let me guarantee you this morning, anyone that is on the outside of the kingdom this morning, they are hungry and they are thirsty this morning. And the word says, let them come and whoever wishes, let them take the free gift of the water of life. I grew up as a missionary's kid. I spent my early years uh, in the Middle East where my parents were missionaries planting Muslim churches throughout the Middle East. And then I moved to France for my high school years growing up in, in Western Europe where in my high school, my French public high school, I couldn't find one other person in that school that believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And then came back to the United States in my late teen years. My wife Kim is a missionary's kid as well. She grew up in Central and South America 
And so from our backgrounds and from the 150 plus nations that we have traveled to in these last 23 years, Kim and I have found that everywhere we go that people are exactly the same. Now at first it doesn't seem that way. You go into a new country, into a new nation, and this thing called culture shock just sort of hits you full on. You go in and just about everything seems different. They're wearing different clothes, they have different customs, they're speaking different languages, they're, they're, they're eating different food. I remember I was in Madagascar, which is called the land that time forgot. It's an island off the coast of Africa, and I was, I was conducting a Book of Hope crusade, and, and after, the, after the crusade, one of the pastors, National Brothers, came to me, he said, Brother Hoskins, would you come to my house for dinner? I said, yes, I'd love to, and so I made my way over to his house, and his wife had prepared this big meal, and I, I began to eat what was on my, on my plate. And as I was eating this one particular dish, to be honest with you, I was thinking in the back of my mind, this is the worst chicken I have ever had in my entire life. It was hard, it was tough, it was sinewy. It was like I was biting through nerves to try and get it down. And so I started analyzing a little bit closer what was on my plate. And as I did, there were certain limbs there that I did not recognize. These were not parts I'd ever seen on a chicken before. I said, Pastor, I said, is this a chicken or is this rabbit that we're eating tonight? He said, oh no, my brother. He said, you be eating baked cat. And I thought, I'd be losing it all over your dining room table right now. I mean, it was bad. Well, it wasn't that bad. It just tasted sort of frisky, you know? I mean, it was... <laughs> I can say that because my wife's not here. She loves cats. And I tell her, honey, honey, I love cats too, but only when they're really, really well done. I am getting some nasty looks from the cat lovers in the crowd this morning. Some of you are shaking your heads, though. You've been there. You've been in those places where your stomach's churning around, your head's spinning around in this new culture. But let me tell you, after you've been there for a while and after you begin to build relationships with people, you realize they are exactly as we are this morning. They have the same needs, the same desires, the same hopes, the same expectations for their lives and for the lives of their children that you and I have this morning. And Kim and I find that it's especially true about children and young people. Everywhere we go in the world, these children and young people are exactly the same. As our world grows smaller and smaller, which it's doing every day, because of transportation and education and technology and communication, our world is growing smaller. And as it does, there is a youth culture that is exploding around the world where young people everywhere are becoming more and more alike. I don't care where I am on the planet. I mean, I can be in the, in the bush in Africa or in a jungle in Central America or clear on the other side of the world in Siberia. These children, these young people, they're listening to the same music. They're watching the same movies. They have the same heroes. And the youth culture that they most emulate, that they're hoping to become most like, is like, guess which youth culture? Ours, that's right, our, our American youth culture is held up as the role model and as the example for the rest of the young people of our world this morning. Does that scare you a little bit? I hope it does. For us to realize that the youth of this world are, are following ours down a road in many cases of moral destruction and lostness, the likes of which is probably unprecedented. When we have brought up a generation to believe that they have to go out there and experience life that's hedonism. They have to go out and try and find that one thing that is going to satisfy their, their quote, individual needs. That's humanism. And we have brought up a generation that has experienced and experimented more than any generation to come before them. And yet, friends, let me tell you, they are the most unsatisfied generation in the history of humanity. Because no matter what it is you experience or no matter what it is you experiment with, it is not enough. It is like a vacuum inside of you. It sucks everything up, but it still leaves you empty because there is only one single solitary thing in this world that satisfies, and that is the good news of Jesus Christ. And that, in a nutshell, is what this meeting this morning is all about. It is about taking the only thing in this world that can satisfy and turn dark hearts bright and that can take those that are thirsty and quench them and can take those that are desperately hungry for something and feed them with the bread of life and the word of God. And that's why as a ministry we were so excited several years ago when my dad was in a time of prayer and fasting. The Lord had given us a wonderful literature ministry where we were publishing Bibles in the major languages of the world. And one day he was praying and, 
And he had a vision, the vision that we just read about in the book of Revelation, where he saw the kingdom of God. And in that time of intercessory prayer, the Lord spoke to my dad and he said, I want you to look over the walls. And my dad looked over the walls of the kingdom. And as far as I could see, he saw lost humanity. He saw them lost in their sin. And for the first time, he saw children and young people like he'd never seen them before. He saw that the battle that raged on the outside of the kingdom was being fought for the next generation. He saw that Satan, in the decades to come that we're living in now, was going to form his weapons of warfare against children at a younger and younger age. And he saw that the enemy was targeting them with violence, and he saw child soldiers, thousands of them, marching in to death. He saw child prostitutes at the age of eight and nine years old being sucked into a life, and, and we see that today with child sex slavery rampant in the world at this moment. He saw diseases like tuberculosis and HIV and AIDS and malaria wiping out tens of thousands of children around the world. He saw drugs and alcohol and sexual promiscuity targeted towards children at a younger and younger age, and we're seeing that right here in our own nation as well. And when my dad saw the reality of what was going to happen, it broke his heart. He was so broken. I remember I was in seminary at the time and I, I came home and I, I can remember my dad sharing his heart with me. I can remember just even walking in the mall and when he would see a child, he would just begin to weep because God had given him a broken heart for the next generation. And we began to pray and fast together and say, Lord, what are you saying to us and what does it mean? And in that moment of intercession, the Lord showed us. He said, the only thing that will overcome these lies is truth and my word is truth. I want you to take my word and I want you to give it to every child in the world. And that's the vision that was birthed in our hearts. I remember my dad would walk in a mall, he'd see a child just broken and we would continue to intercede, say, Lord, how can we do that? How can we take your word to every child? 2.4 billion children on the planet right now. And the Lord says you'll reach the children of the world and you'll do it through leaders. It's a very specific word. And so we decided to take our, our best. We had, just, we had just produced the Thompson Chain Reference Bible in Spanish. And so the Lord said leaders. So we took those Bibles and we identified the top 50 leaders of every Latin American country. And we sent it to the presidents and the vice presidents, the heads of education, the heads of commerce, the leading business people, the leading military people. We embossed their name on gold on each one of those leather Bibles. And inside of that Bible, we put a letter. We said, this Bible comes to you from friends in America. We're concerned about you. We're concerned about your nation. We believe this is the word of God. We believe it has a hope and a future for future generations of your country, and we commend it to you. And then we began to intercede as those Bibles went out to those leaders. Friends, don't underestimate the power of intercessory prayer. And as we begin to pray, God began to move on the hearts of these leaders of nations. And they began to call, they began to contact us, they began to ask us to come to their countries, and we began to go meet with these presidents and vice presidents. And then one day in the office, we received a letter from the Minister of Education from the country of El Salvador. He wrote, he said, thank you for sending me this Bible. He said, I haven't read the Word of God in a long time, but I used to when I was a little boy. And once again, God has stirred my heart, and I now believe it is the Word of God. He said, I am responsible for the children of my nation. We are in the midst of a horrible civil war and it is the children that are suffering the most. And then he asked us a question. He said, would it be possible for you to provide a Bible for every child in the public schools of our country? I don't know about you, but we got kind of excited about that. I mean, here we live in the States and our kids can hardly take a Bible to their school anymore. And here was a minister of education asking who would come and give the word to all the kids. Well, I gotta tell you, my dad's an excitable guy. I mean, he got that letter and he read it out to the office and he was literally running around the office because God was beginning to fulfill that vision he'd put in his heart. And, and I remember he turned to the assistant and he said, send that man a letter. Tell him we'll send the Bible to every child in the schools of El Salvador. And he continued to jump around and dance around. And, and the assistant came back and she said, Brother Bob, how many kids are there in El Salvador? He said, I have no idea. She said, well, I think you better find out because we just promised them all a Bible. We found out, Pastor, there were 986,000 children in that country. Woo, yeah, except we weren't laughing. Because we didn't have the half million dollars we needed to send them all a Bible. But how many of you know when God puts a vision in your heart 
and he sets before you an open door. He will always make a way for his people, won't he? He will always make a way for us. And as we began to pray, we said, Lord, what should we send these kids? You know, you send a kid a big black leather Bible, and it's kind of hard to understand. It can be a little bit intimidating. You know, it's great at the beginning. You have the story of creation, but then some pretty strange things start happening in Adam's family. You have God saying, go into the villages and towns, kill everybody, wipe them all out. You know, 22 foreskins nailed to a wall. You know, what does that mean? That's pretty hard for me to understand, much less a seven-year-old little kid, right? What do they need to know? They need to know that Jesus loves them, that he has a plan for his life, their lives, that they have a hope and a future. Where is that found? That's found in the Gospels and the Good News. And so we took the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we harmonized them, we put them in chronological order. We took out the chapter and verse so that it read straight through like a story. The most exciting story there's ever been. What's more exciting than the story of Jesus? You know, friends, we've, we've heard it so much, we've almost grown callous to it. We've almost forgotten the majesty and the wonder of a loving heavenly father who sent his son to die for us, to give us redemption, to give us eternal life. We put it all together and we called it in Spanish, El Libro de Vida, what became the book of hope. And it's an amazing story how God began to move on the hearts of some of our friends in churches just like this, in Mission Sundays just like this, with people who were faithful in their faith promise so that those pastors were ready to say, Brother Bob, Brother Rob, we're ready, we're gonna go with you. And just in a matter of weeks, we were able to print a million copies of the Book of Hope. Now, this is just one copy here this morning, but I want you to try and imagine with me what one million of these look like. I mean, it would, it would more than fill this sanctuary from top to bottom. It was nine 40-foot sea containers, 256 tons of God's Word. How many of you know there's a little bit of power in 256 tons of his word? You know there is. And we took those containers and we sent them down to New Orleans and we put them on a ship. They went to Guatemala. There were nine tractor trailers waiting. They took them overland into El Salvador and, and their missionary, John Bueno, a missionary. Friends, don't understand this morning that when you give to your faith promise, none of this happens without, without the faithfulness of God's people being prepared and ready. And so the church in El Salvador was there and they had a letter from President Duarte giving them permission to go into every single public school in the nation of El Salvador. And they began to go out. And for the first time, many of those churches that had been confined to their four walls broke out into the city and they went to the heart and core of the city. They went into the public school system. Let me tell you the greatest spiritual warfare that is taking place this morning is not taking place in churches or in mosques or in synagogues. Those are places for the most part where decisions have already been made. But Satan goes to the place of decision. He goes to that place where he can find those that are most open, those that are most receptive, those in the most formative years of their life. And I want to propose to you that the greatest spiritual warfare that takes place in our world takes place in the schools of our world. And that church began to go into that public sector with permission from the government. And as they began to hand out God's word, an amazing thing began to happen. The teachers and principals and directors began to ask them, is this all you're gonna do is just give the book to the kids? Can't you tell them what's inside the book? And our brothers and sisters in El Salvador had the chance not only to give God's word, but to stand up in every public school and proclaim the name of Jesus and give their testimonies and give altar calls to an entire generation of young people in El Salvador. I mean, we, we had no idea what was going to happen. You know, we see so little, and God takes our little, and he makes so much out of it, doesn't he? I mean, he can take, and, and you might sit there this morning and say, Rob, those, those, those two billion plus people on the outside of the kingdom, what difference is my little faith promise gonna make this morning? Friends, I have good news for you this morning. Jesus can take your little, and he can make it much. He can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all you could ever dream or imagine this morning through your faithfulness and your obedience. And that's what we saw in El Salvador. We began to see a response to the gospel like that nation have never seen before. It started a children and youth revival that has gone on for 23 years in that nation to where today, 75% of El Salvador is born again evangelical believers. I'm talking about the power of the word of God, the power of God's word to change a nation. And after we saw what happened in El Salvador, we said if we could do this here, why not in Guatemala, why not in Argentina, why not in Colombia, even Spanish, why not in French, in Portuguese, in Tamil, in Hindi, in Chinese, why can we do what God commanded? Why can we take God's word and give it to every single child in the world? 
And suddenly it began to happen. Those world leaders began to respond. They began to invite us to come. President Pinochet in, in Chile invited us down, and we met with him in his presidential palace and, and President Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua. You say, or, you know, Pinochet in Chile, wasn't he a fascist dictator? And Ortega in Nicaragua, isn't he a, a communist? You know, would, would you go meet with fascists and, and, and communists? Hey, we'll meet with fascists, we'll meet with communists. We'd even go meet with members of the Supreme Court of the United States of America if we thought it would help get our Bibles back into schools here in the United States, amen? And suddenly the door, the doors began to open. Let me tell you, friends, this morning, the problem with our world being reached, for those on the outside of the kingdom this morning, the problem is not open doors. Sometimes we imagine that there are such high walls and barriers around these nations that they can never be penetrated with the good news of Jesus Christ. Friend, let me tell you, there is nowhere on this planet that is close to the sovereign move of God's Holy Spirit. He will go where he will, when he will, and what does it say? Not even the gates of hell shall prevail against him. You know, we see this black curtain of Islam where I grew up and we think it's impenetrable. There's no way in our time, in our generation that we could ever cut through that, that, that black curtain. Friends, let me tell you this morning, what we've experienced in the last several months is just the beginning of a rumbling that's beginning to take place where God, by his sovereign power, is gonna rip that curtain apart so that the good news of Jesus Christ can flow into the nations. God is ready. He's out in front of the church. He's saying, church, if you have an ear to hear, hear what I'm saying. If you understand the spirit of God, then listen to what I'm telling you. I am out in front of you, church. This is the time. This is the 11th hour. Do not fall asleep in the 11th hour, but awaken yourselves to realize now is the time for this good news to go into all the world so that every nation would know who Jesus is. And after we saw what happened, we discovered that with 10 languages, we could reach over 60% of the school children of the world. We found with 20 languages we could reach nearly 90% of the school children of the world. And we said, God, as you help us, we're gonna take your word, we're gonna put it in a simple, a relevant, a dynamic form into those languages, and wherever you open the door, we're gonna go. And we made this list, you know, Pastor, we thought we were really good missiologists. So we had, we had put all the easy languages at the top of the list, those countries where we thought maybe they'll let us in. And all those impossible languages, they were down at the bottom of the list the Hindu countries, the Buddhist countries, the communist countries. Isn't God still saying to his church, oh ye of little faith? How many of you know we make our list and God makes his list? And they don't look an awful lot alike, do they? I mean, God just shattered our list. In a matter of months, we began to get appeals from countries we never dreamed we would ever go. I got a call from a Swedish businessman he said, I've heard about this book you're giving to children around the world. He said, I've been an exporter into the former Soviet Union. He says, I have meetings with the government. I want you to come with me. I went with him and I found myself sitting in the office of the Minister of Education for the former Soviet Union. I began to share with him about the Book of Hope and what it was doing for kids in other countries. He stopped me. He said, excuse me. He said, you know where you are? This is the Soviet Union. We have pastors in prison for even owning a copy of the Bible. And he says, but everything is changing. And we have something new coming to our nation. And it is called choice. And with choice will come everything from the West. All of your movies, all of your music, all of your drugs, all of your pornography. And he said, I believe we are looking at the greatest moral catastrophe this world has ever seen. And the words of that man are becoming prophecy in the nation of Russia today. He said, if what you're telling me is true, if this book can bring some hope and some answers to our children and to our young people, he said, we welcome it into our nation. And my dad and I walked out of his office with a letter of permission to give the book of hope to every school child in the former Soviet Union, 62 million kids. There is nowhere close. God can go anywhere, anytime he wants. And you say, well, Brother Rob, then what's the problem? I mean, here we are on this Faith Promise Sunday and we're talking about reaching a third of the world that has never known him. 2,000 years after Jesus gave us the command, why has not the job and the task been done? If it's not open doors, what's the problem? Some might say, well, those on the outside of the kingdom, those who have never heard, those that have rejected him, maybe they're lost because that's their desire. 
Maybe they're there because even if they were given a chance that they would reject him anyway. I'll never forget one of the first schools I went into in Russia. Like the communists always do, they like to show you their best face first. So they had taken us to one of their elite schools where they had their leading teachers and their best students. Members of the press were there to show this new openness, this new glasnost to the nation. And so we began classroom by classroom and we were giving out the book of hope. The principal was with me. We came to one class and she said, Mr. Hoskins, in this class, I not only would like for you to give the book to the children, but she said, I would like for you to tell them the story of Jesus. It's inside the book. And she said, you have five minutes. I looked at those kids who'd been taught their entire life that Jesus didn't exist, that God was a lie, that Christianity was a myth, that this book was a fairy tale. And I thought, Lord Jesus, how in five minutes can I tell them your story? Aren't you glad it's not our job this morning? That you and I have no power to convince or convert or convict anybody, but it's the sovereign work of his Holy Spirit. And he can do more in five minutes, friends, than you and I can do in a lifetime. He can do more in five minutes than it took communist atheism 70 years to build. And I stood up in front of the class and I just began to tell the story of Jesus in the most simple way I could. And their teacher was translating for me. She was an English teacher. She was a consummal leader, which means she'd been sent there to indoctrinate these kids in atheism. And I remember at first she was so bold in what she was translating, but after several moments her interpreting kept getting slower and slower. And so I, I, I turned to see what was wrong, thinking she's angry, she's having, to, she's having to translate these things she doesn't believe. And I turned and I looked at that 32-year-old teacher Tears were flowing down her cheeks as she heard the story of Jesus for the first time in her life. She took her hand and she reached across and she put it on my arm. She said, sir, she says, I'm sorry, I can't continue. I need to know right now, when school is over, what man do I speak with? What church do I go to so that I can accept this Jesus in my life? I said, ma'am, you don't need to go to a church. You don't need to speak to a man. I said, right here, right now, you can ask Jesus into your life and he will set you free. And a smile broke across that Russian teacher's face and she began to speak to her kids in Russian and they were talking back to her. And she turned to me, she said, the children wanna know, can they accept Jesus or are they too young? I said, no, if they wanna accept Jesus, have them stand to their feet. And 32 out of 32 12-year-olds stood to their feet in the center of Moscow and bowed their hearts and were reconciled with their Heavenly Father and their Savior, Jesus. Friends, let me tell you, the problem with this world being reached is not hunger or thirst. Those on the outside of the gates this morning are hungry and thirsty. And they are lost not because they don't have a desire to know. What does it say in his word? Does it say they they perish for a lack of hunger or they perish for a lack of thirst? No, it says they perish for one reason. They perish for a lack of knowledge. And they are lost this morning not because they don't have a desire to know. They are lost because they've never been given a chance to know who Jesus is. Our problem this morning is not hunger and thirst. Our problem is not open doors. You say, Rob, what's the problem? The doors are open, the people are hungry, we have the tools. Some might say, well maybe that's, that's what this Sunday is all about. Maybe it's an economic problem. Maybe it's a financial crossroads that the church is in that we can't get through and so that's why we do a Faith Promise Sunday or that's why we take offerings. Maybe, maybe if, we, oh, if we only had enough money. My dad was in Brazil and he was meeting with President Collard de Mello. We were asking permission to distribute the Book of Hope in the slum suburbs of Sao Paulo. And as my dad was sharing and casting the vision, there were some other men there and one of them stood up. He said, I'm sorry to interrupt you, sir, but he said, I must tell you, I am not from Sao Paulo. He said, I am the the senator from Rio de Janeiro. And he said, I must insist, if if you bring this book to Sao Paulo, you must also bring it to Rio. And another man stood up, he said, I'm the governor from Belo Horizonte. He said, if you bring the book to those cities, you must bring it to our region for all of our children and all of our schools. And the president said, you know, they're right. We have freedom, we have equal access in this country. So he said, if you bring the book of hope to Brazil, you must bring it for all of our children and all of our schools. 
My dad flew back to Florida where our offices are. He said he went in the office and he just shut the door and he literally laid prostrate on the floor before the Lord. And he was crying out to the Lord. He was saying, Lord, he said, you know, this has gotten too much. He said, you know, when it was a couple thousand copies here and a couple thousand copies there, he said, I could, I could handle it. And he said, as soon as he said, I can handle it, the spirit of the Lord fell on him. The Lord said, who, who do you think you are? He said, you couldn't handle it when it was a couple thousand copies. Is that right? He said, this is my vision. This is my burden. This is my work. And he said, Bob Hoskins, I demand one thing of your life. And hear me this morning, friends. He said, I demand a pure heart and a pure motive. He said, if you can keep your life pure, then I can keep using you. God cannot work through unrighteous vessels. We cannot stand his presence if we're unholy. From that day, we stopped praying for money. I remember I used to pray for money. I'd go to a nation. I re- this, just the last month, I was in the Central African Republic, which is the second poorest nation in the world. It's a country over these last 12 years that has been through three civil wars. It has the highest percentage of child soldiers in the world. But there's a new minister of education that was just appointed. He's a wonderful, spirit-filled brother. And he'd heard about our Book of Hope. He sat there and he said, please, please help us. We're so poor. He says, we have one textbook for every eight students in our school system right now. He said, would you come and bring the book of hope for every school child? He says, I promise you, we will make it our textbook and we will build this nation on the foundation of the word of God. He said, bring us two million copies of the word right now, please. In the past, I would have come before the Lord and said, Lord, we need two million books. Oh God, send us $600,000. But when he told me that, I went back to my room that I was staying in and I my face. I said, oh God, keep me pure. Keep my heart pure and keep my hands pure. Keep my mouth clean. Keep my marriage pure and keep my children pure. Because I know, friends, if I can take care of my broken, carnal heart and keep it supple, keep it righteous before the Lord, then there is nothing that is impossible for us. And friends, it's true for you this morning. As you look at a lost and a dying world, your job is not to sit down and say, I think I can make this much money, and this much goes to my house, and this much goes to my car, and this much goes to insurance, and this much goes to education, and and I've got this left over, and and of that I think maybe I could give this much. Friends, that's not faith, that's planning. We're not talking about planning this morning. If we had tried to plan this, you know what, we never would have given one book to one child anywhere in the world. Faith is coming before an almighty God and saying, Jesus, I realize I am nothing and I have nothing. I don't even know what one day will bring. You say, no, 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 I have my future planned out. I know how much is in my 401k. I know exactly, I I have job security where you know nothing. God comes before you and he says, put your life in my hands and come before me with faith this morning and I will do something in your life like you have never seen before. And I guarantee you this morning, it is a guarantee from heaven itself. If you step forward in faith this morning and say, God, here I am, I'm your vessel. Speak to me this morning, Lord. Open my eyes so I can see what you see. Open my ears so that I can hear the cries of the lost this morning. Lord, make my heart soft for those that don't know who you are. And if you pray that prayer, God will break your heart this morning. And when he breaks your heart, then you say, here am I. Send me to the nations. And when you say that, then God will put something in your spirit, man. He'll put faith in your heart like you've never had before. He'll put a number in your heart for this faith promise. 
And friends, if it's faith, let me, let me guarantee you, it's not something you can do on your own, but I can guarantee you, when God gives you a vision, he will always give you a provision. God has been so faithful. He has never let me down. He has never let our ministry down. There has never been once where we have not been able to print every time a door has been opened to us because, friends, we serve a mighty God this morning, and nothing is impossible with him. Nothing is impossible with the Lord. Hallelujah. Money is not our problem this morning. Money is not our problem. Can you see, Pastor, if you filled these faith promises out with great faith this morning? And, you, and it, was, it, was an, it was an extraordinary number for you. And can you imagine God in heaven going, oh no, oh no. I, I can't handle that, that kind of faith. You know, solid rock, you, that's too much. I can't do it. It's ridiculous, isn't it? God's just waiting for us to exercise our faith so that he can pour out his blessings upon us like never before. Our problem is not money this morning. Our problem is not hunger this morning. Our problem is not open doors this morning. Our problem is the same as it's been for 2,000 years. Our problem is obedience this morning. It's about a church like us on a morning like this coming before the Lord and saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? I surrender myself to you. I learned this lesson for myself in the city of St. Petersburg, Russia. We had people like you that were with us in the schools. And Pastor and I are already talking about taking a group from this church to go into the public schools somewhere in the world. And we were working in the schools, but it was May Day, and so the schools were closed for holidays. And so I went to a pastor, Pastor George, and I said, George, what are we going to do today? The schools are closed. He said, I've organized for you to go to the children's hospitals. So we began to go into the children's hospitals and begin to give out God's word. And what we saw there would disgust you this morning. We saw them wrapping kids with dirty bandages and they were using syringes 20, 25 times a piece. And all I could think about, all any of us could think about was our kids back at home, friends, but for the grace of God, that's you and me. And we got on the bus and we'd done several of them. We were headed back to our hotel and no one was saying anything and I could just hear people weeping on the bus. And George turned to me and he said, Rob, he said, can we go to one more? I said, George, it's late, the team's exhausted. I said, we, I don't, and he, he was always very soft-spoken, very mild-tempered, but he took me by the hand, he said, please, pojausta, one more, one more, one more. So I said, well, if you think it's that important, we will. And so we turned the bus around, we headed the other direction, and he began to explain, he said, the place where we're going is the largest mental institution in the communist world. And he said, it's a ward for children. And he said, I believe this is where Atheistic communism is the strongest. These psychiatrists believe somehow that they could alter the minds of these kids and make them better. And he said, to tell you the truth, we don't even have permission to go into this place. So we pulled up outside and he went in to speak to the director and we began to intercede on the bus. He came back out several moments later. He said, I've spoken to the director. He's gonna allow us to come in, but we're not allowed to speak to any of the children. We can just give them the book and then we have to leave as quickly as possible. I said, that would be fine. I walked up to the doors of that institution and and the moment I went into that place, I felt a spiritual oppression and darkness come over me like I've never experienced in my life before or since. And I grew up in the Muslim world, I know what darkness is. But this was something that was so evil and so demonic and the team felt it and then we began to hear the noises and then began to go into the rooms and see these kids. Many of them were restrained so that they couldn't hurt themselves. They were crying out, they were yelling out, they they were tormented. We couldn't say anything to them, but we began to take God's word and we began to put it on those bedstand tables. But inside of our hearts, we began to do spiritual warfare for that place. And we began through our prayer walk to begin to pull down the strongholds that the enemy had had there for more than 60 years. And as we did, God began to break our hearts. He began to give us our heart for those kids and, and all of us. And I remember I was just weeping and tears were flowing down my cheeks and I was headed towards the last room and I, I looked up and my eyes met the eyes of the director of that institution, this communist psychiatrist. And he had a puzzled look on his face. He stopped me and he said, sir, he said, excuse me, but the room where you're going into is, is where our most serious cases are. He said, these children have been here for a long time and to tell you the truth, we've been able to do nothing with them. He said, I can't help but notice how much you people seem to love our children. He said, I hear there are some spiritual people with you. He said, would it be possible for them to pray with the children that are in this room? And I said, sir, that's why we came here today. I walked in that room and I saw the 30 most depraved children I've ever seen in my life. Their bodies were twisting and writhing around. They were crying out. 
they were mentally disturbed and mentally retarded. And I asked the people that were with me to form a circle around those kids. And we began to lay hands on them. And in the name of Jesus, we began to call out on their behalf. And it wasn't but a few moments later, something rose up inside of me. And I just cried out. I said, God, bring your peace to this place. Bring your peace. And it wasn't a few moments. It was like a wind that came over us as the Spirit of the Lord began to fall on us in that room. Friend, if you don't believe in spiritual warfare, let me vouch for you, it is the realest thing there is on this planet. And as the presence and the peace of God began to fill that room, everything began to change. I noticed the boy I'd been praying with, he began to grow still. I noticed the noise level in that room began to come down and I opened up my eyes to see that out of these mentally deranged and mentally retarded kids, that tears were flowing down their cheeks as they felt the presence of their heavenly father for the first time in their lives. I looked across the room and I saw George, that Russian pastor, and he was over in the corner and he was huddled over a boy I found out later was 13 years old. And as I looked at him, his, his body was like it was in convulsions almost. He was just sobbing and weeping uncontrollably over this young man. And I've got to be honest, in my, in my, in my carnal heart, I thought, I thought, he looks strange, he looks bizarre. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, Rob, that's how I feel. That's how I feel. Friends, get a picture of God this morning. Sometimes we picture God luxuriating on some throne in heaven. That's not how the Bible shows him. What has Jesus been doing for 2,000 years? The Bible makes it very clear. He has been ever interceding. He has been before the mercy seat of the Father. And he has been crying out to the Father. And what is it saying? What is he saying? He's saying, Father, not yet. Father, wait. Father, there are so many that it's still not heard. There are so many, it says he tarries and he waits because he is not willing that even one of them should perish. He's crying out before the mercy seat of the Father and his heart is broken this morning. And I moved over to that Russian pastor and I laid my hands and I began to intercede with him and he prayed and prayed for such a long time and then finally he noticed I was there and he turned around and he looked up at me and he said, Rob, he said, you don't even know why I brought you here today. But he said, this boy is my son. For the first time in my life, I've been able to pray with my boy. And God broke my heart that day. And God spoke to me and said, Rob, you are the salt of the earth. And you are the light of the world. That's what he says to you this morning, church. You are the salt of the earth. And you are the light of the world. Let your light shine that those on the outside of the city would know who he is. In a world that has lost all of its savor, in a world that waits in darkness, Jesus gives us the opportunity to come before him and say, Jesus, I don't know why God chose us. Man, if I was God, I would have, I would have done something far different <laughs> because I know our weakness. But I believe the word and God's not gonna come with a, with a legion of angels and proclaim his name in the sky. He's not gonna speak with a heavenly voice and proclaim who he is. Jesus turned to us, us mortal, feeble, weak men and women and boys and girls that are sitting here this morning and he said, now, I've done all I can, now you go. I'll send my Holy Spirit, he'll be with you the entire time. You go and you preach and proclaim this good news to every person, heavenly Father, you are here in this place this morning and we sense your spirit is travailing over your people this morning. That deep is crying unto deep this morning. Brothers and sisters, I just want you to submit yourself to the power of the Holy Spirit this morning. And Lord, right now I pray, not by my words or any story I've told, Lord, not by any emotional response, but by the power of your Holy Spirit, Jesus. Speak to your children, Father. Speak to them, Lord, and put your heart, transplant your heart in theirs, and open up their ear to hear, and let their unseen spiritual eyes see what they have never seen this morning, so that we could be your children. In Jesus' name.
Solid Rock family, I want you to listen to the whisper of the Spirit. Because if you sense what I sense, you know God is in the house. And the Holy Spirit is speaking and the Holy Spirit is revealing His passion for the lostness of humanity. And He wants to draw us to that place of challenge and the place of making an impact for Him. What Brother Rob is telling us is real stuff, family. And it's the very reason for which Jesus Christ came to this earth. And it's the very reason for which Solid Rock exists. That we can extend the grace of Jesus to every corner of the earth. There's a couple of things that I'm going to ask, Solid Rock family, and I want to listen to you, Pastor. This moment that we're here belongs to God and to God alone. And the way that we can honor the Lord is by honoring the sanctity of this moment. It's not your moment. It's not my moment. God put his breath in your lungs today because he wants to speak to our hearts. And he sent this man to challenge us. This man speaks eight times, eight Sundays a year in America. He's all over the world preaching the gospel. And I was thinking that God opened up his door, the door for him to be here because God wanted to speak through Rob Hoskins to our heart and our lives. And I'm going to ask that everyone hold steady. Because God deserves our apt and our riveted attention. Our ushers are going to come. And ushers, I'm going to ask you to hand out a faith promise to every single person in this room. And this is what I'm going to ask, Solid Rock family. I know you have the capacity to hear the voice of God and I know that you have the capacity to feel the presence of God and the hurt of God and you've felt it today. If you can't feel anything, you need to be at this altar crying out to God to somehow take a hardened heart and make it supple once again. For this moment, we have come to say, Lord, I want my heart to be pure and I want my heart to be so tender before you. And I want you to speak this faith promise opportunity is our opportunity to put ourselves out there in faith and trust and say, Lord, I truly want to hear the whisper of your voice in what I can do to make a difference in this world. Can I tell you there is wealth in this congregation beyond imagination. There's hidden wealth. There's untapped wealth. There's, there's wealth that you have found to be your safe zone, your security. And friend, I want to tell you something that, that our wealth is not our security. God is our security. I was reading in 2 Chronicles just the other day about King Jehoshaphat. In fact, it was yesterday. In which he was facing an incredible army. An army so great that he looked at that army and he was overwhelmed. And in a moment of his desperation, he cried out to God. And he said, you've got to help us. And God spoke to him. He said, I will help you. And God came and delivered Jehoshaphat and the children of Judah in a miraculous military victory. One of the greatest military victories in all of the Old Testament. It wasn't long after that, that another army came against them. And instead of Jehoshaphat turning to the Lord, Jehoshaphat looked at his wealth and he looked at his army, almost a million strong. And he looked at the king of Israel and he said, would you align with me while I go and fight against this army? Nary a once did he look to the Lord. And as a result of that, Jehoshaphat, because he looked and leaned upon his resources and the military alliances, caused the judgment of God to come on him and upon the children of Judah. Can I tell you, friends, we will bring about the wrath of God anytime that we look to our own resources or our own human alliances and coalitions to accomplish the work of God. This moment right now is between you and God, between me and God, as we say, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? I want us to pray. I don't know, Brent, if we have that conversion table up there, but if you'll take that faith promise, gentlemen, if you'll hand that card out for me as quickly as possible, I would appreciate that. I want you to look at your faith promise cards and I want you to look at the conversion table and I'm going to ask you to listen to the voice of God because God may speak to you about giving to our, to our missions enterprise on a weekly basis. 
you'll see the configurations and the extrapolations as if you choose to give such and such a week, let's say $115 a week, over the year that's $6,000. You may want to give 461, which is 24,000. There is wealth that God wants to tap in this place that we can turn it loose in extending the gospel of Jesus Christ to all four corners of the earth. And friends, let's hear what God is saying to us. Time is very, very short. Before you put pen to paper, I want you to listen. I want you to pray. Then I'm going to ask Devon if you will come, my friend, to minister the presence of the Holy Spirit in this house. Would you look at that for a moment? Everyone been served, Robbie? Anyone need a pen? If you need a pen, just lift your hand. Together we will make a difference. Lord Jesus, we cry out to you and say, Help, Lord. Speak to our lives. Speak to our hearts. Touch us. Touch us, Lord Jesus. May your Holy Spirit brood over this congregation and may you inspire us to faith and to sacrifice like we've never known. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I pray. Amen. This is what I'm going to ask, family. Everyone in this room can do something. I know some of you filled it out last week. Some of you may have filled it out Wednesday night. If you fill it out today and you filled it out last week, we will accept your most recent faith promise expression. And then if you want and you believe God that God is challenging you to give more than what you gave last week on that faith promise card, we will not use that card. We'll use this card as a more recent expression of your desire to partner with us to, to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. And with all of us doing our part, no matter how small or how great, it's together we will carry the load and make a difference. I am believing that we'll have more faith promises turn in this year than in the history of Solid Rock. Join with us as we make a difference. Would you fill that card out as the Spirit of God leads you? Devon, come and minister, my dear brother. God bless.